How did uh, you guys like the storms that came through? Did you enjoy the tornado? I mean, the hurricane? Whatever that thing was that blew a lot of rain and water through here? Let me just say, it was exciting at the Smith household. We had, uh, we had a little leak that sprung, and I uh, saw little spots on the ceiling. And um, then the next morning when I woke up, my sheetrock was kind of dangling. And then before I had my first cup of coffee, and this is the problem, before I had my first cup of coffee, the ceiling comes into my living room. Yep, just falls down in the living room, insulation all over the place, sheetrock, my, my you know, light in the, in the dining room is doing like this. Just. So what did I do? I called Brian Taylor. Called Brian, I said, Brian, I got a problem. He said, no problem, we'll take care of it. And lo and behold, if like guys don't start showing up, coming out of trucks, climbing up, it was fantastic. I, 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 my dad would have got on to me if I didn't. I got some trash bags and I started packing stuff in trash bags. And as one of the guys walked in there, he goes, what are you doing? He said, I'm trying to clean up. He goes, yes, my job. I said, well, I hear you. But if I wasn't picking this stuff up and my dad knew that I wasn't picking this stuff up, my dad would still give me a whooping and I'm almost 50 years old, and I know good and well that when there's a mess on the floor, you better get to work and pick it up. So I was picking it up. But they showed up. Man, they, they put a tarp on my roof, and they, they cut out some more sheet rocks and made a small hole bigger. They took all this stuff away, mitigated everything, got fans blowing on my house, got my dining room stuck in the living room and in the kitchen, and, and the, it just all over the place. Needless to say, the Smith household right now is in a little bit of chaos. There is stuff all over the place. I, you're kind of having to, okay, I need to move this out of the way so at least I can see the TV, and I need to clear this off so I can get to the, to the stove, and I need to get this cleared out so I can at least sit down at the table. It's just, there's just a lot of chaos. It's, that's what storms do. They kind of come in, they break things, they destroy things. And I'm going to be honest, I've only been, I guess, maybe 30, 48 hours, probably not even that long. And I'm already looking forward to the day when that's fixed when I can have peace back in my house. Because right now, <laughs> I'm weird. the Smith household is living in the midst of a little bit of chaos. And that is okay, because that happens, but peace will come. And peace will come back, and peace will come when everything is put back the way it's supposed to be, and everything has been restored to the way it was before the tornado, I mean, the hurricane, I mean, whatever this thing depends on. So today we're going to be talking about this idea of peace. So if you have your Bibles, you can open those up to Matthew chapter 5. That's where we're going to take our text from today. But then if you also want to flip over to Ephesians chapter 4, put your finger in there, we're going to get to Ephesians chapter 4 a little bit later. But we're going to start today in Matthew chapter 5. Peace is a a wonderful word. We like to talk about peace. Uh, I don't know if you've been following the news, but there's been some significant peace agreements lately with Israel and countries in the Middle East, right? Peace, conflict, right? We've, we've reduced conflict in the Middle East, and we call that peace. Yes, the, the, the reduction of conflict. That's, that's kind of one way to look at peace. But peace is a relationship to rescue uh, I don't know if you, any of you ever kind of taken the, the whitewater rafting trip, gone down the river, or the last time I did whitewater rafting was the Nantahala up in Tennessee. And that water up there is cold, a lot colder than the water down here. And uh, if you get knocked out of the boat, there are places where guys are standing on the shore with a rope, and they'll throw you a rope, and you grab a hold of the rope, and they'll pull you out of the current, right? That's a nice thing to have, a safety line when there's, a, when there's danger, right? And so sometimes that rope, that hope, I'm running down, I'm caught up in the current, and that if they're really good, they'll hit you right smack on the head with that rope when they throw it out to you. And peace is like that. Peace is a little bit like this idea of this rope that pulls you out of this chaos and confusion. It is a relationship builder of reconciliation. Peace. Uh, it is a life preserver. It is a preserving of happiness. Peace. We want peace. We look for peace. We strive for peace. We try to live at peace. Uh, And it's a reminder that we are connected to the one who made peace through his blood. And so today we want to look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. 
Matthew chapter 5, verse 9 says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. The first thing I want to draw our attention to today is this, that there is this peaceful, easy feeling. Is that kind of thing? I got a peaceful... Anyway... Right, this concept. Is there, a, are we striving for a, a peaceful feeling? It's the question. The concept of peace is kind of woven into the very fabric of Jewish culture and Hebrew literature. When you start reading from Genesis all the way through, especially the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament, it's, it's peace is woven into the very fabric of the culture. And the word that is used is shalom. Shalom, and, and it's oftentimes used as a greeting. Somebody comes up, shalom, and hello, peace. It's kind of this peace to you. Uh, it's a really important word because it is it is a, a important concept in Jewish culture. It's not just the absence of conflict, however. Um, there is a desire to make things whole. The actual word itself, shalom, the actual word simply means complete or whole. That's what the word in and of itself means. But depending on how it's used, it can carry a lot of different weight to it, a lot of different significance to it. It's not simply conflict resolution. right? Just because you are in tension with people, or just because there's countries at war, and we have peace, that doesn't mean that we have reached shalom. Just because we've signed a peace agreement between two people, just because we've negated or resolved conflict between two people, doesn't mean we have shalom, peace, in the Jewish culture and as Jesus would be referencing it today. It is, it is often a much more intricately woven word. The Talmud kind of explains the idea that the entire Torah is for the sake of the way of peace. We think of the law, we think of rules and regulations and ordinances and do's and don'ts, what the Talmud kind of teaches, and Jewish culture kind of teaches, is that, that the intent is to bring about peace. In 1 Samuel, um, Jesse tells David to go check on your brothers, right? They're in this, this fighting with the Philistines, and Goliath is on the border. And David's sent by Jesse, and he says, Go see your brothers, Shalom. Let's see how well they're doing. What, how's their well-being? In Exodus 22, there's an ordinance, a law that's given that if your cattle gets kind of out of their pen and they run on, trample on the vegetation in the, in the, in the garden of a, of a neighbor, in Exodus chapter 22, the law says that you shall shalom double for their field. You should pay them back. It's the same word, shalom, peace. It's not just conflict resolution. We're trying to restore Something. This is the idea of peace. Resolution, restore, completeness. Um, in Joshua chapter 8, when they're getting ready to build an altar, uh, they're told to make an altar of shalom stone. Perfect. The stone doesn't have any crack or crevices or nicks or cricks on it. A perfect one. One that is complete. Shalom. In Job chapter 5, we see that, that Job says that you shall know that your tent is at shalom when all of your herds are complete and nothing is missing. Shalom. It is peace. It is a much broader and more intricately connected concept than just conflict resolution. It is about the idea of restoring things to the way they are intended to be. It is about completeness. When um, the temple is being built, the tabernacle, excuse me, the temple is being built, and they put the last stone in the building, they say it has been... Shalom. Complete it. Right? It is this notion or this idea that things are a particular way, and when they go out of that particular way, chaos, disorder, disarray, when you return them to the way they are designed or intended to be, you have brought shalom, peace. The Smith household is looking forward to shalom, peace. When things return, to the way the house was designed and intended to be. Your life is looking for shalom. When your life returns and becomes the way God designed it to be. Your relationships are looking for shalom. 
when they return or they become complete and whole the way God designed and intended them to be. Therefore, peace is more than a feeling. Peace is not just feeling at, at, at calm. It is much more than that. We see this in the expression of God. Peace is synonymous with God Himself. Peace is synonymous with God Himself. And all throughout Scripture we see this reality that God is a God of peace. Romans chapter 16, verse 20. Romans chapter 15, verse 33. God is a God of peace. We see that Jesus is of peace. Romans chapter 5 Verse 1, Ephesians chapter 2, He is the Prince of Peace. Matter of fact, when He is born and the angels come and declare, they declare Him as one of peace. Peace. God, Jesus is the God of peace. He is the Prince of Peace. But we also see that His presence is indwelling within us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we see that the power of the Holy Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, is the Spirit of Peace. Peace is intertwined, it is interwoven, it is in the very fabric, in the very character of who God is. It is, it is God is peace. He makes peace, He brings peace, He restores peace, He makes it possible for you and I to have peace. Because He's a God of peace. And it's not just conflict resolution. Peace is also synonymous with the gospel. The mission of Christ is to reconcile man to himself through peace. That is his mission. He came to reconcile, to do what only God, man, could do. And you and I are invited to enter into the sphere of God's active participation. We are invited to participate in God bringing a peace to the world through the gospel. With, hum with, with His active use of you and I as vessels and instruments of peace, we can pursue peace with one another, and we can pursue peace with our culture and our community and our neighbors. If I were to kind of take the sermon today and kind of wrap it up into a sentence, here's the, here's the underlying thought that I want us to be aware of. Rather than search for a peaceful feeling, strive for a mission for peace. Instead of searching for a peaceful feeling, instead of searching to find comfort, instead of searching to find this place of, of peace, be on mission for peace. This is our goal. Rather than search for a peaceful feeling, strive for a mission for peace. So what does this mission look like? Second point today is I want us to recognize that there's the power of peace. Peace is a powerful, powerful um, uh, mechanism. It is active. It's not passive. You don't encourage and develop peace passively. Peace is not just avoiding people because you don't want to have conflict. That's not peace. That's avoidance. Peace is not saying, well, hey, I think we're okay. Things are good because you know, we haven't had a fight in a while. That's not peace. Peace is not just simply avoiding things or kind of being um, not actively involved in conflict. It's not peace. Peace is finding a resolution and making things whole, bringing things back together that are connect, that were connected and have been broken back to connectedness. It is about developing and cultivating meaningful rela peace. It is an active thing. It's not a passive thing. And it requires us to be active. There's a story that the story is told. Um, there's a, kids who are playing, brothers and sisters. They had this disagreement. They were fighting. And by the end of the day, they were just in a tough with one another and were, didn't want to be around one another. They were mad at each other. They were just angry. Oh, my brother. All right. And they were off, sent off to bed. And early in the morning, you know, like 2 o'clock in the morning, a thunderstorm comes up and lightning crashes. <laughs> the house rattles. Right? And, and Dad gets up and he's kind of, what's going on? And he hears a little commotion and he, he hollers down the stairs. And he's like, what's going on up there? And they hear this little voice coming out of the closet somewhere. He says, we're all in the closet. We're forgiving each other. It's amazing when problems come about, all of a sudden, the desire for peace. Hey, we need to get, I need to, we're scared. Let's get in the closet together. 
yeah, but I don't like you anymore. You can't get in my closet. Go find your own closet. Oh, we're all clustered together. We have forgiven each other because the moment has required us to forgive one another to be in the closet together because we are scared of this storm. Jesus, Jesus was notorious for taking what was familiar and flipping it on its head. He was notorious for taking what was the um, generally accepted religious teachings of the day and saying, yeah, you really aren't getting it. Let me help you understand it. He was notorious for going further than expected and making things more intentional than had been before. He, he was a little bit of a rebel that way. He would push the buttons and he would challenge and push against the traditional view. What he would all, You've turned the traditions of man into the laws of God and he would push back against those things. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9 in our text today, he is shifting the Torah's emphasis for peace by crafting a whole new word. A whole new word. This word, peacemaker, is only found right here. Out of Jesus' mouth, he crafts this new word. He takes the word for peace, shalom, or in the Greek, arene, and he adds another word to it that causes action, and he creates this word, peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. He crafts this new word. And in doing so, it creates a different feel for the idea of peace. It's no longer bless you or have peace or, hey man, I'm glad you're okay, hope you, hope you do okay today. There is now an intentionality of action permeating the very idea. Jesus started a new work. He called His followers, His disciples to come and work along with Him to make peace, not just to wait for peace. They were commissioned to be ambassadors. They were commissioned to be mediators. They were, conditioned, they were commissioned to engage the culture to change it. They were conditioned to bring about the kingdom of heaven which is at hand. They were commissioned to bring about His peace to people's hearts and lives. A peacemaker is one who works to restore peace between people. Not only between God and man, which is an important relationship that needs peace, this peace that we have because we have a relationship with a loving Father who came, who sent His Son into this world to die for our sins, who died, who was buried, who rose again, who now makes intercession for us. We need peace with God. And the only way we have peace with God is through the blood of Jesus Christ. But not only should we work to make this peace, we need to work to make this peace. Peace with one another. Flip over to Ephesians chapter 4. Excuse me, chapter 2. This is not on the screen, so you have to actually look this one in the Scriptures this morning. Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, we're going to look at verse 14. Read a couple of verses here. For Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 says this, For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility. I want to pause right there for just a moment. A dividing wall of hostility is what separates us from having peace. That is not intended. A dividing wall is not intended. And so the way in which you have peace, the way in which you have wholeness, the way in which you have completeness, is you remove the dividing wall and you allow that which God designed to be reunited again. You take and you remove the division so that it can be restored. Verse 18, by abolishing, he, he did this, he, he made us of one flesh and, and abolished the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might, and here's why he did this, this is why, that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two and so making peace. He did this so that he could take these things that had been divided and bring them into one. Make them complete. God is about bringing about peace. God wants us to know that the apex or the height of Christian character is our relationship with other people. We demonstrate our love of the Father by how we 
treat and deal with other people. We have peace with the Father, and it is demonstrated by having peace with others. And Christ came as the Son of God, the Prince of Peace. He died on the cross to abolish that thing that causes division so that the two could become one, so that we could be complete and whole. Peace. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3 says that we are called to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Unity through peace. It's not an easy thing to be a peacemaker. This isn't the kind of thing you do half-heartedly. It's not the kind of thing you do whimsically or without a little work. Because it's not an easy task to do. It requires action. It requires wisdom. It requires tact. It requires courage. It requires love. It requires humility. Submit one to another. To be a peacemaker means that our presence in the world will not only help bring an end to fighting and hostility, but will take what is broken and restore it to wholeness, whether it is our lives, our relationships, or the world. Being a peacemaker. You know, if you go back and you look at Genesis 1 and 2, how God made us, how God designed us, the relationship He intended for us to have with God. They walked in the cool of the day. There was an intimate, personal relationship that God designed. We are bearing His image. And as God designed us, sin broke us. And what peace does is it fixes it. It it reunites it. It it brings that back to completeness and to wholeness. Peace. But it requires work. I think we could summarize this statement by this. The presence of peace points others to Jesus. The presence of peace points others to Jesus, which is why I think the second part of this verse is so potent. The third point I want to bring out today is proud to be called son. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God, or daughters of God, people of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be known this way. I'll tell you, um, my dad texted me this morning, because he knew I was preaching today. He said, I'm praying for you, son. He didn't say, I'm praying for you, Alan. He didn't say, I'm praying for you, Mr. Smith. I'm praying for you, Pastor, whatever. I'm praying for you, son. Something incredibly potent about that word. I, I have a 13-year-old son now. Oh, 13, praise the Lord, bless me. Right, I got a 13-year-old boy now. He's, he's my mini-me. I can't deny it. I don't, I don't want to deny it, but he's my... He's my son. And and it's it's incredibly encouraging when somebody says, do you know what your son did today? My first response is, I don't know. What did he do today? Right? But you may tell you what's amazing is when somebody says, you know what your son did today? And they go into a little story where they tell you where he, he made a good decision or he did something well. I'm just going to tell you that is an exciting moment in my life. When when someone tells me that my earthly son did something in a way that reflects the character and the intentionality that we've been trying to instill in him, it's exciting. So when we, as Christians, as image bearers of God, as sons of God, as joint heirs with the King, When we do those things that are honoring and consistent with his behavior, he goes, yep, they're my son, that's my daughter. They're sons of God. When we are peacemakers, when we strive to bring peace, not only into our life, but into others' lives, into our community's lives, into our world, when we strive to bring peace, wholeness, completeness, 
bringing things back to working together with one another in a meaningful way that reflects the gospel, God is honored and glorified and people go, are you one of those Jesus people? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. We reflect His character. It is a connection to being a child of God, being a peacemaker, acting like our Heavenly Father. We are called sons of God because we resemble Him. Not necessarily in looks and appearance, but in action and in character. We begin to look like our Father. We begin to look like the Son. We begin to act like the Spirit. And we're actively striving to bring about peace. We are the children of God. And it shows. You and I have experienced peace. We've had peace with God because we are His child and He has shown us peace and He has given us His peace that dwells within us. Because we have experienced peace, we are invited on mission with God to offer peace to the world and to become brokers of peace with the world and to become brokers of peace with our friends and our neighbors and our community. Because God has loved us, He has given us peace and has invited us in the participation of bringing peace and hope to the world. It requires us to participate. There's an action for us. It requires us to do things like listen well. We need to listen. You know, a couple weeks ago when I preached, we looked at blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We talked about this idea of mercy as being able to look into and think like someone else and to feel like someone else and actually get into the very heart and mind and soul of somebody else to see the world the way they do it. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall see mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. In order to live that out, we need to learn to listen well. We need to be merciful. We need to be able to listen. And here's the deal. We've got, to, we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful when we're listening. Because if we're not careful, here's a warning for you. If we aren't listening well, what happens is our own biases, our own predispositions, our own selfishness, our own ideas begin to filter what we're hearing, and it will inf infect our ability to be effective. Because we're not listening. We're hearing, but we're not listening. And it is imperative that we learn to listen if we want to bring about peace. Because we need to hear the heart, and we need to listen to the heart of the person talking. We need to hold fast to truth. Hold fast to truth. Now, be aware of the following statement. There is a truth. There are not many truths. It's not like live your truth and I'll live my truth. That's not a thing. Right? That is a postmodern um, falsehood. We don't have multiple truths. It's not like you live your truth and I live my truth. We don't follow the church of Oprah, right? We're not, you've got to live your own truth. That's not a thing. There's truth, and then there's not truth. Right? There's the truth of the scriptures, and then there's the not truth. We have to hold to what is true. But, but be aware of this thing. Peace, peace must not be sold at the expense of truth. We don't bring about peace and do whatever we got to do and throw truth out the window because that'll, that's what will bring peace. That's not peace. That is false peace. But we do do so in love. Love. Love, love, love. Love well even when we disagree. If we want to be ambassadors of peace, if we want to be peacemakers, if we want to reflect the character of God in our community, in our life, in our family, in our friends, we must love one another in a way that is unusual and atypical. It must be the kind of love that people go, that is strange. I don't understand that. Here, here's a, I'm going to, I'm going to blow your mind. Are you ready? You can be a Republican and love a Democrat. 
You can be a Democrat and love a Republican. You can look different than somebody and love them still. They can be of a completely different ethnic or color and you can still love them. That's mind-blowing, isn't it? In other words, you don't have to just love people that are exactly like you. Matter of fact, I'd encourage you to find some people that aren't like you and love them. If we want to bring peace to the world, we need to listen, we need to hold the truth, and we need to love one another. All the laws hinged on these two things. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And if we will do those things, we will be ambassadors. We will be peacemakers. In doing so, we can stand on the shores of our loved ones who are being swept into the current of culture. And we can offer a life rope of hope where they can stand in the security of the shores of peace. But we have to be ambassadors of peace.